last time, <clears throat> we started talking about uh, modern physics, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, and just the very basic ideas of quantum physics um, with electrons. We, you know, photons, we started even earlier. And of course, I, I gave you sort of the uh, uh, drive-by overview of the idea of quantum field theory, um, which we're not doing anything mathematical with at all. Um, but uh, quantum physics, which is um, intrinsic to the structure of the atom, um, and it sort of underlies a lot of the scientific developments in the 20th century, not just in physics, but in chemistry and biology as well. Without understanding of atomic structure and stuff like that, you don't get DNA, right? DNA, one giant molecule. Well, all right, so the first, uh, the sort of two main ideas in quantum physics, actually there's a bunch, but here are two of the, the really core ones. One is stuff is quantized and the name quantum physics gets it from that. We talked about the spin of an electron. So when we say spin, it's angular momentum. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit, it's not the same exactly as a spinning ball, but it really is angular momentum. So it's, it's like a spin. So that's why we call it spin. But the funny thing about electron spin, well, there's two funny things. One, all of them spin at exactly the same rate if you measure their total angular momentum. So the total angular momentum is always root three over two times this quantity h bar. And you can't speed up or slow down the spin of an electron, which maybe is a little weird, but okay. So the spin rate of an electron is part of its fundamental property. But then uh, angular momentum is a vector, so you can try and measure its components. And if you try to measure the z component, say, or any component, but we'll call the direction you're measuring it the z direction. If you try to measure the z component of electron spin, you only ever get one of two values, either plus one half or minus one half in units of this, again, fundamental constant h bar. So there's a few things about this. First of all, that's weird. Why can't you get zero with a regular spinning ball? If I had the spin oriented so that it was um, you know, sort of spinning up and down, which means the axis is pointing straight to the right. If you measure the up and down spin, which means the spin along an axis that's up, you would get zero. But that never happens for an electron. Here's another thing. I didn't mention this last time, but it's worth noting. The biggest value of spin you measure is plus h bar over 2. Well, remember that I just said that the total angular momentum of an electron is root 3 divided by 2 h bar and root 3 is something like 1.7. So you never measure an electron fully spinning up either, right? It can't be entirely in the z direction. It's um, got a definite z component and when you measure it you either get plus one half or minus one half. But the total angular momentum is more than that, which means there has to be some in x or y. But then what happens? Well, let's go to the next slide. We'll talk about uncertainty. The second big concept of quantum mechanics is that it's a probabilistic theory. All of the physics theory, I think, basically all of the physics theory we have talked about all that semester and all this semester is deterministic in that if you have the equations of motion, um, F equals MA, right, is one of the equations of motion. Um, and you should put that together with velocity is rate of change of position and acceleration is rate of change of velocity. Put all those things together, you can figure out exactly perfectly where a particle is going to go later at time. And this sort of led to a view of the clockwork universe, um, which was sort of a growing view of, hey, the universe seems to, to all fit together in a deterministic way like clockwork, which raises philosophical questions about is there such a thing as free will. Um, that was, you know, sort of ruled the day in 16th through 19th century physics. Quantum mechanics is different. Quantum mechanics can't tell you where the particle will go. All it can tell you is a probability of where the particle is going to go. And what's more than that, it's not like statistics of stuff you don't know, right? So um, if you, you know, with statistics, imagine that you have a population of people and their heights vary. So let's take college students, right? And if you measure the heights of all college students, you're going to discover there's an average height of something like, I don't know, five foot eight inches or five foot seven inches, something like that. And, but there will be a distribution. So you can give me a probability. There's a plus or minus, a standard deviation, an uncertainty on that. Um, and that's just because college students have lots of different heights. But if you measure one college student's height, you will get a height for that person. So that statistical uncertainty is sort of the population. You don't know. Um, uh, it's like 
you can know one person's, but maybe you don't right now, but you know that all the college students are in this range. Quantum uncertainty is different. It's not that you have lots of electrons and they're at different positions and here's the uncertainty. It's that each electron does not have a definite position or a definite momentum, but all it has is a probability distribution for where it would be if you were to measure it. Now, when you measure a quantity, you get something definite. So if you go back to the electron spin, if I measure the z component of angular momentum, I either get plus h bar over 2 or minus h bar over 2. And the same, if I measure the x component, I get plus h bar over 2 or minus h bar over 2. So when you measure it, you get something definite. Same token, if I measure the momentum of an electron, I get a definite momentum. But before I measure it, it doesn't have a definite momentum. So by measuring systems, you change the state of systems. So particles are in indeterminate states. And the Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells you sort of the minimum level of indeterminacy you can have. You can always have more than this. It happens all the time. But the minimum level of indeterminacy you can have, well, it, there's lots of pairs of things that can't be determinate, can't be precise at the same time. Position and momentum is one of them. If you take the intrinsic uncertainty, just the the not just unknown, but does not have a definite position of a particle and its momentum, you multiply them, the quantity has to be greater than or equal to h bar over two. And so in lots of cases like atoms, it turns out it's very close to h bar over two. So those atoms in their ground state and their lowest energy state are as um, confined in both space and momentum as you even can confine an electron, it turns out, something like that. Um, so, so that's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And it turns out measuring the exact position of an electron is, is difficult. Um, so what quantum mechanics does is it doesn't tell you how does position prob propagate. It tells you how do these probability distributions propagate. The fundamental thing that moves around in quantum mechanics is not positions and speeds of particles. It is probability clouds. That's what quantum mechanics propagates around. So if we come back to put together angular momentum, spin of an electron, um, and quantum uncertainty. Well, first of all, just again, classical physics, you can perfectly, and that star is on perfectly because there's always, I mean, first of all, classical physics is a model that only applies if you're measuring stuff big enough that quantum doesn't matter, but to any reasonable degree of precision, right? So if I wanted to measure a length of an item, I can measure it with a really good equipment. I could measure its length down to the micrometer. In fact, you don't even that good equipment. You can get, um, reasonably priced, not too hard lab equipment to measure stuff to within a, a, a micron, certainly within um, hundreds of a millimeter, and then a micron would just be a factor of 10 smaller than that. You can measure perfectly stuff. So angular momentum, if you have a spinning ball like that guy over there, it's spinning around. Um, given the direction of spinning, you use the right hand rule to figure out the direction of the angular momentum vector. The way I've drawn it, it's pointing entirely up. Um, and I could measure, so orient the spin any way you want. That'll be a vector pointing any direction, which means it'll have all of X, Y, and Z components. I can measure the total angular momentum, and I can measure all of the three components and get them all perfectly. Turns out, if I know the three components, I can calculate the total. So that's not four different things. That's really just three different things. Whereas in quantum mechanics, um, only the total and one projection can be definite at once. So there's an uncertainty principle thing going on here between say the Z spin and the X spin, sort of like position and momentum, only now it's different directions of spin. If the Z spin of an electron is definite, it's X spin and Y spins are both indefinite. So remember what I said before is that the Z spin of an electron, if you measure it Z spin and you get plus H bar over two, it's total angular momentum is root three over two times h bar, which is bigger than h bar over two. So it's got to have components other than z, but those components are completely indeterminate. So it has a definite z component, but its x and y components are indeterminate, but they have some probability distribution that indicates um, they're not going to be exactly zero, but they're not exactly anything. Right? So it's kind of weird. So in quantum physics, you can know the total and you can know one projection and they're both quantized. We'll come to orbital angular momentum later. For electrons, the total is always the same. The spin, if you measure it, is quantized. So again, if you compare an electron to a macroscopic spinning ball, I did this last time, there's a bunch of differences uh, between the two. And so I'm gonna, I won't go over all this again because I did last time. So, all right, now that we've talked about electrons and we've introduced quantum mechanics and all this, what we really want to talk about is atoms because that's, everything's made out of atoms. They always say, don't trust an atom because they make up everything. Um, 
I have a shirt that says that. And actually, it turns out that's very wrong because most of the universe is made up of dark energy and dark matter, which is not made out of atoms. But never mind. We're not going there in this class. People sometimes say, oh, an atom is, is just like a small version of a planet orbiting a sun. Um, and it's, it is and it isn't. So in some ways it's like that, in some ways it's not. So the planet orbiting the sun, though, is fairly easy to visualize. You've got the sun, you've got the planet. It goes around in a circle, actually an ellipse, but the Earth, goes, it's very close to a circle for most of our planets and our solar system. Um, and you could work out the energy of this planet going around the sun. So it's got kinetic energy, one half MP. So MP is the mass of the planet times its speed square, right? Kinetic energy, last semester. And the potential energy of the Earth or whatever planet orbiting the sun, its potential energy is minus big G times the mass of the sun times the mass of the planet divided by R, the distance from the sun to the planet. That's just the potential energy of um, the gravitational potential energy of a planet orbiting a star. That's its expression. So its total energy is one half mv squared minus g m s m p over r. That's the total energy. Well, all right. What I want to do is plot the potential energy as a function of position, and that's what this slide shows you. Right. So this red line, I am just plotting the. Um, I'm just plotting the potential energy as a function of R. Horizontal axis is R, vertical axis is E. You notice the potential energy is negative everywhere. And that's because big G and the masses and the distance are all positive numbers. And so then um, the total energy can be anything, actually. Um, it turns out if um, right here at R circ, that's the, um, the radius of a circular orbit, um, but it's possible for a particle to, to have to not be in a circular orbit, so sometimes it's closer and sometimes it's farther from the star. And if it's closer and farther, that means its potential energy is different at different times, but it will have some total energy. And that's what this green dotted line is supposed to indicate. It's some particle that maybe right now is at what I'm calling R circ, but it won't always be. But um, it has more energy than the potential energy, so it's got to have some uh, kinetic energy. In fact, that's even true for a circular orbit. So, and in fact, actually, I think the way I've drawn these lines, it's about right for a circular orbit. So it doesn't have to be circular, but if it is circular, your total energy has to be more than your potential energy because you do have some kinetic energy. If you didn't, it wouldn't be orbiting in a circle. It would be at rest, and then it would fall towards the sun and burn up, and that would be bad. Um, so the total energy is something greater than our circular. So the main reason I'm showing you this is I'm going to use analogies here to this plot. The red line is the potential energy as a function of position. Um, and then the dashed green line tells you the total energy of the particle, well, planet. Um, so the total energy is its kinetic, kinetic plus its potential energy. That also means there's a maximum distance the particle can get to, because if it had to get farther than that distance, its potential would be bigger than its total. So it won't get any farther than that. And a planet can be in an orbit of any size. It's continuous, right? I can make the orbit very slightly smaller. And if it's a circle, that means that its total energy is going to be a little bit down. Um, or I can make it very slightly larger. You can always do that with a planet orbiting a sun in classical physics. Well, now let's go to a quantum two-body system. And you notice here, I don't even tell you the kinetic energy. It's still 1 half mv squared. Um, but uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, remember, p potential energy is related to position. And momentum is related to velocity. Kinetic energy is also related to velocity. You can't have a definite potential and kinetic energy at the same time. So that's why I'm not going to tell you what is the kinetic and potential energy of an electron, because we can't know both at once. But I can tell you what the potential energy as a function of position, if an electron were there, is. It's just minus ke squared over r, and we've seen that before. It's just the electrostatic attraction between a proton of charge plus e and an electron of charge minus e, and their distance r apart. But notice I don't draw the circle here, and I did that on purpose. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to plot this potential, and look, it's 1 over r, so it's a constant, but minus a constant over r, so it has exactly the same shape as the gravitational one I showed you. So that's the potential energy, but here's the thing about atoms. Whereas a planet orbiting a sun could be in an orbit of any radius and ha therefore have any energy, electrons and atoms can only have certain specific energies, right? So there's one thing we call the ground state because it's the lowest energy possible. It is impossible for an electron to have a lower energy than some value E1. Whereas you can actually have a planet have a energy that's as low as you want. Um, ultimately, you'll have to dump it into the sun to make its gravitational potential energy that low. And then it'll have thermal energy, but 
okay, whatever. If instead of this, well, we don't want to go to black holes because then there's general relativity, but it, it's a continuous thing and it can get as low as you want. In quantum mechanics, the total energy of an electron in an atom can only have certain values. So it could be E1, it could be E2, it can't be anything in between. Very different from classical physics, very different from a planet orbiting a star. The electron can be in this energy state or that energy state, and it can't be anywhere in between. The energy states are quantized. And it is possible for it to change from one energy state to another by conservation of energy. For that to happen, the energy has to go somewhere. So that can be a collision, and it sends kinetic energy off into some other particle, or it could be a photon. And we call it a quantum leap or a quantum jump when a particle goes from one energy state to another. So when people talk about a quantum leap being a really huge leap, Actually, it's a really small leap, typically, um, because it's the energies of a single atom are really small because atoms are really small. So a quantum change in energy is a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of energy. But it's big for the electron. And you'll notice going from the ground state to the second state. So we call that E2, the first excited state as compared to the ground state E1. Um, that's actually three quarters of the way up to energy of zero. Um, so on the scale of the atom, a quantum leap is actually pretty big. And then it turns out the energy states get closer and closer together as you get to zero. And there are actually an infinite number of them. But, and they get really, really, really close together when you get up to zero. But the lower energy states are widely spaced. And then usually the electron will be in the ground state. So if it's hydrogen, you'll have one electron. It will be in the E1 state. And so then you'll know the energy of the electron. It is possible to excite it. Talk about that in a little bit. All right, now, so this is, <clears throat> I've plotted energy versus position. The red line is the potential energy, and then the green dashed lines are the allowable um, energies of the particle. But remember, electrons aren't at a specific position. So whereas the planet, if we go back a couple of slides here, if it's in a circular orbit, the planet is at that R. It has that R, so you know what its potential energy is, so you can figure out what its kinetic energy is. In the atom, the electron has this much total energy, but it's uncertain how much of that energy is kinetic and how much is potential. And so for that reason, we will sometimes use a more abstract diagram instead of plotting the potential energy function. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. We'll just say it is a potential well, right? So what's a potential well? Uh, that's something where there's a dip in potential that um, stuff can fall into, right? Things fall to lower energy states. It's very much like a well on the ground. If you think of gravitational potential energy, MGH, a well goes down into the ground goes to negative h if you measure h relative to the ground it's a potential well it's a physical well it's also a potential well because it's a lower energy thing and if you drop something into the well and it doesn't have enough kinetic energy so you're say you're down in the well and somebody drops a baseball um, if you don't throw it fast enough to have enough potential energy it can't get out of the well it's trapped in the well so we draw these little square potential wells to represent the, some quantum potential well, and then the lines represent which energy states are allowed. It's more abstract because we haven't actually plotted the, the potential energy, um, but all we're trying to do here is represent what states are available, right? So, and then the fact that there's a bottom on this well, really, you know, if the previous slide, that red line would go all the way down to minus infinity. Here, the bottom on the well doesn't really mean anything because there will be a lowest energy state, E1. Um, so sometimes we just draw a bottom wherever there are some gravitational or some quantum potential wells that really do have a bottom. Um, the potential of an electron and atom is not one of them. So we draw these just as a way of visualizing um, energy. So you have these various energies, E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, and it turns out in hydrogen, we know exactly what those energies are. The energy of the nth state is minus Ry over n squared. So n, we call that a quantum number. It's the principal quantum number. It tells you just which energy state the electron is in. So n starts at 1, and it just goes up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever. And then ri, the Rydberg, is, um, and if you notice the, the units of n, it's unitless. It's just a number. So ry has to have units of energy. Ry is 13.6 electron volts, and that's probably a number you've heard before. Where an electron volt is an amount of energy, one electron volt is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. That's the same number, actually, as the number of, um, well, as the charge on the electron in coulombs. And that's not an accident, um, but it has to do with um, moving an electron through a potential energy of one volt. But EV is not volts, it's energy. Electron volts, it's a measure of energy. 
and it's that many joules. So you see, it's a really tiny amount of joules. So the amount of energy we're talking about, if you go from the n equals 1 to the n equals 2 state, is going to be 3 quarters of 13.6 eV, which is a tiny amount of joules. So quantum leap, very small. So this allows you to calculate what is the energy level of an electron in the hydrogen atom. So the lowest energy an electron can have is minus 13.6 eV. What does that mean? Well, remember, th trying to throw the baseball out of the well, if I want to get the electron off of the proton, so we call that ionizing, If I, so because you, you turn the atom into a positive ion, right? ionize. If you get the, to get the electron out, you have to put at least 13.6 electron volts of energy into the atom to get the total energy up to zero, because if we go back to this slide, right, the total energy zero is where the atom can get out of the potential well, right? So that's the way we usually do it, is we define energy zero when the atom is infinitely far away and is not trapped. And then if the energy is positive, it's far away and it has some kinetic energy, right? So it's moving around. If the energy is negative, that means that it's trapped in the atom. It's bound. An electron bound to an atom has a negative energy in its orbit. And for hydrogen, this is what they are. Then that's, you can use this to approximate all the other atoms, and we will later, but strictly this number really is only right, and this exact sequence of 1 over n squared is only right for hydrogen. Right? So the electron in a hydrogen atom, um, this is what I said before, to know the potential energy requires us to know the position, to know the kinetic energy requires us to know the speed, but the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says we can't know both at once. So we can't know both p potential energy and kinetic energy at once. So we can know the total energy, but the electron does not have a definite kinetic or potential. The sum is definite. How much is kinetic, how much is potential is indefinite. Again, this is one of the big ways in which an atom is not like a planet orbiting a star, because the planet does have a definite potential kinetic energy. And then here's another thing. The orbitals look very different from orbits of planets around stars. Planets go around stars in circles or ellipses. The electron does not circle the proton in a hydrogen atom, despite the fact you may even in a chemistry class have learned the Bohr model of the atom, which says that the electron circles, and that is wrong. The Bohr model misleads. Um, it's valuable, and it can you can calculate stuff, like this minus 13.6 over n squared stuff. You can calculate that. Uh, but the Bohr model has some wrong things in it. Um, in particular, if an electron is in the ground state, so that means its total energy is this E1, or minus 13.6 electron volts, it has zero angular momentum. A planet orbiting a star has angular momentum because it's going around, right? It's going around the star. There's, there's orbital motion there. We call it in orbit, the electron around the um, proton, but it's not orbiting in the sense of going around because there is no orbital angular momentum. Now, the electron still does have its own spin angular momentum, but the orbital angular momentum is zero. And so it's not going around because going around would have angular momentum. And in fact, it's in this spherically symmetric probability cloud. So what I've shown you here, um, on the upper left, I've taken a cut through the spherical probability distribution of where the electron is. So this is um, just in the xy plane, what is the probability um, density, or really what is probability density is just probability um, as a function of a little volume in space, probability per volume, that's what probability density is, but you can just think of it as the probability of being at certain positions, and that's an okay way to think about it. This is the probability density, so the brighter the pixel in this upper left thing, um, the higher the probability the electron is there. So again, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the electron does not have a definite position, but it is in a probabilistic way smeared out over this cloud. And it's not that the electron moves around within this cloud and the, pro and the probability tells you how much time it spends at different places. It's that the electron itself is probabilistically, in a quantum probabilistic way, smeared out um, over all this. Thing. So the whole cloud is the electron, right? The electrons, it's a point particle, but because its position is indefinite, its effective charge is spread out over this whole cloud. Now you'll notice there's a dip at the center. It looks like gray, actually, and that's just because there's a finite resolution. You see the little pixels here. It's a little square. Um, exactly at the center, the probability is actually zero. So the probability of finding the electron right on top of the proton is zero. 
Uh, but then it gets pretty big and then it, it falls off and it, and it turns out it looks like it goes to zero because it goes to black outside, but that's just because of the limits of how I could plot this. Actually, it's still a really, 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 really dark gray out there. And technically the probability goes out to infinity. So every atom, the electron is spread out all the way to infinity, which is bizarro, but that's not meaningful because the probability, once you get out to a radius of a couple of angstroms, I've plotted out to four angstroms here. Once you get out to a radius of four angstroms, the electron in the ground state of hydrogen, um, the probability that it's within that four angstroms is like 99.999 some odd percent. So practically speaking, you know, formally it goes to infinity, practically speaking, it doesn't really. And then the average distance um, so what that is, is take all these probabilities and weight them and add them all up and figure out what the average of all that is, is about half an angstrom, where an angstrom is 10 to the minus 10th meters. So the electron is about half an angstrom away from the proton, but it's not at that radius, right? It's probabilistically spread out. Now, of course, this is just two dimensions. Lower right, I've tried to plot it in three dimensions. Um, and it's a fuzzy ball. You may have heard me talk before about the electron atoms being fuzzy balls. So the the, the probability cloud for where the electron is, is a function of x, y, and z, is this fuzzy ball. It's not at a specific radius. It's not a sphere, but it is spherically symmetric, right? And in fact, if I try and look at this and I rotate around and I look at it from different angles, um, you can see that whichever angle you look at it from, it looks exactly the same. And that's what something that's spherically symmetric is. Whichever direction you look at it from, it's still a sphere. Um, but it's a fuzzy sphere. Right? And so you notice it doesn't have a hard edge. It's not that here's the shell and the electron is inside that shell. It's that here is the probability cloud. And yes, there are parts that are denser than other parts. And you get far away, it gets really low dense. But it still is this fuzzy shell. So the electron is smeared out over all of that probability density. Whereas the nucleus, the proton, is right at the center of that. So given that this is what an atom looks like, this is why. This is one of the really big ways why an atom is not like a planet circling a star because when a planet circles a star, if there's just one planet, if there's going to be a plane of its orbit and it's going to be going around and have angular momentum. The electron around the hydrogen atom is not in a plane. It's spread out over a full spherical distribution. It has no angular momentum. So it's not even orbiting in that sense because it's not going around and its position is probabilistically all over the place. We call this an orbital Right, so the orbital means the um, place where the electron can be, although that place isn't a place, but a probability distribution. But so it's a uh, probability is a function of position. That given probability distribution is the orbital, and it has energy for hydrogen of minus thirteen point six electron volts. That's what electrons and atoms are like. So this, you often see atoms drawn like this, right? On the left is the planet orbiting a star. And if you ever did the Bohr model, you probably drew this picture. Misleading, because in the ground state, electrons don't circle. Um, on the right, you see that picture of an atom is light. And really, that's still the Bohr model. And it's misleading, because electrons, so there's a few things. First of all, the electron does not circle in a regular path. A planet around a star goes around in either a circle or an ellipse, and it follows the same path over and over and over again. The electron is not going in a definite in a path because it's not at a definite position. So you can't even trace out a path of where it's going. It's not that it moves around within the orbital. It's that it is simultaneously, probabilistically throughout the whole orbital. So these circles that atoms, are, the electrons are supposed to be following, they're not really there. Um, also, the orbital is always a 3D probability distribution. It's not a planar orbit, which is what, what these things all look like planar orbits. And then they have no orbital angular momentum. So these pictures of atoms, they're very common. The one on the right you see absolutely all over the place is misleading. And it's really sort of an outmoded model of the atom that you still learn in lots of classes. Uh, lots of intro physics classes will teach it. I think lots of chemistry classes teach it. But the Bohr model of the atom um, it gives you a way of figuring out the minus 13.6 over n squared electron volts, but it uses a model that I think is misleading enough in other ways that we shouldn't be using it anymore. Well, all right. <clears throat> so that's what an atom looks like. I will come back to the other orbitals in a little bit. But how do we know this? Well, we know it one way because we have a theory that tells us how it works. But how do you know your theory is right? Well, in science. Your theory makes predictions. You test those predictions. If the predictions don't work, then the theory has problems. If they do work, 
then maybe the theory is right. You never absolutely know a theory is right. But once it's made a whole bunch of predictions at work, you start to have a lot of confidence in it. So we have a lot of confidence in the quantum mechanics that predicts the orbitals of atoms. So that's how we know this. But what are the measurements we make that confirm these? Well, we send light at atoms and we let the atoms absorb light. Now, if you send light through gray glass, right, so just smoky glass, um, light of any wavelength will be absorbed, right? It's just, it's just dark. And so some of the photons get absorbed, some don't. Atoms are different. Only specific wavelengths will be absorbed, right? So here's the picture. You go from the left. So here's an atom, which I've represented as one of these abstract potential wells. And then I've drawn a little spot to show where the electron is. So the electron is in the ground state here. And a photon comes in with wavelength lambda. Well, you could figure out what is the energy of the photon, hc over lambda. If that energy is exactly equal to the difference in the energy levels of two allowed states in the atom, so in this case, delta E that I've drawn in the picture on the right is the difference between the n equals 2 and the n equals 1 state. So delta E would just be E2 minus E1. If that delta E is exactly equal to the energy of the photon, the atom can absorb the photon. In so doing, and because energy is conserved, it'll absorb the energy of the photon, and the atom's energy gets higher. The electron jumps to a higher state. Um, if the hc over lambda was equal to E3 minus E1, then the electron could have jumped up to E3, which is the next dotted line up above the one where I drew it. If, however, the photon's wavelength is such that energy does not correspond to the difference between any upper level and the current level of the electron, the atom just simply cannot absorb the photon. And the photon will pass it right by. And so th this is how you test this. Um, first of all, for atoms to behave like individual atoms, you have to have them in a low density environment. So you pack them together in a liquid or a solid. Um, the interactions of the atoms modify all the orbitals and they don't act like individual atoms anymore. So you want a low density gas. So that's often what we do is vapor tubes, neon lights, work exactly this way, except they're emitting rather than absorbing. But you get some low density hydrogen gas, get a low density atomic hydrogen gas, which happens in space all the time, by the way. And in fact, a lot of these um, absorption lines, as we call them, were originally observed from the sun um, and other stars before we even had explained them with atomic theory. Um, but you get a low density gas, you shine light of all wavelengths through it, you look at what gets through, what you will see is that most of it gets through, but there's specific wavelengths that get absorbed. And so if you imagine the light, so imagine light going through a prism and you see sort of the rainbow spread across. If specific colors are missing, there will be black lines where the light of that color is not there. And so we call these absorption lines because if you think about a prism and the kind of schmear of rainbow that it emits, there's some width to it. And then there's a, a line all at one color. We call it an absorption line. Um, shine light through hydrogen gas, look at which wavelengths are absorbed. If the wavelengths that are absorbed correspond to the energy differences that we predict, then we have some confidence that our theory is right. And in, in fact, it does. Right? You look at which wavelengths hydrogen absorbs, and those wavelengths are exactly what you would expect given the differences in energies between allowed states for electrons. By the same token, only specific wavelengths can be emitted. So um, here, again, what I did, actually, previous page, this little arrow here, when I drew an arrow up, that's indicating that the electron made a transition from that lower state to the upper state. Um, so here I've got two diagrams. Instead of showing you a before and an after, I tried to show it all in one picture. So on the left, I have an electron that started in the n equals 3 state and jumped down to the n equals 4, sorry, n equals 2 state. So it jumped from 3 to 2. It will emit a photon. The amount of energy that the photon has is exactly equal to the amount of energy that the atom lost. And the atom lost E3 minus E2, because its initial energy was E3 and its final energy was E2. So the that'll emit that photon. You can also see another one. You can see it going from E4 to E2. And in one of the uh, things we would have done in lab, we look would have looked at the emission spectra of a bunch of different gases, including hydrogen. Um, what you do is you actually shoot electrons through. You run a current and you shoot electrons through this low density hydrogen gas. The electrons hit the atoms and excite them to excited energy states. Um, and then as they fall back down to the ground state, they emit photons. And then when you look at the spectrum, you see only specific wavelengths of photons. So you would have seen a bright 
So imagine the vapor tube is vertical and you send it through a prism. It'll spread out in a rainbow. So if it's vertical, it'll spread out in a rainbow off to the right. Normally you would see all colors for white light, but in hydrogen, you see vertical lines. You see a bright red one that is at 6562 or 6563 angstroms, one of the two, I forget exactly which. Um, that is exactly the photon energy that corresponds to a transition from the n equals three to the n equals two state. You also see a nice sort of blue green one at, um, I don't remember, 48 something angstroms. I don't remember off the top of my head, but whatever it is, the, the photon energy corresponds exactly to E4 minus E2. So if you have atoms, and you excite them somehow, you pump energy into them. So maybe by running electrons into them, they can absorb that energy, but they will only absorb energy that allows, that lets electrons go to another allowed state. So at any given time, the electron, the atom, the electron in the atom will only be in one of these allowed states. And then if it's in an excited state, those states aren't stable. They will eventually, the electron will eventually jump down until it's to the ground state. And when I say eventually, it's a tiny fraction of a second. So pretty quickly, if you have an excited atom, they fall down to the ground state. But if you keep exciting them, you have lots of atoms, you keep exciting them, you have lots of them falling down to the ground state at all times. You can see all the photons emitted by all these atoms. You only see specific wavelengths. And that tells you there are only specific energy transitions in the atom allowed, which tells you there are only specific energy levels allowed for the electron. So that's how atoms work. Now the hydrogen spectrum is pretty simple. Lots of other atoms, the spectrum gets way more complicated. Well, okay. So um, we've talked about energy states. Then there are other orbitals. Um, so the n equals one orbital is the one that we've mainly been talking about, although we have said there are excited states. It turns out when you get to n equals two and n equals three, it is possible for the electron to have some orbital angular momentum. Now it still doesn't orbit in a circle. It's still a probability cloud, but it can be in a probability cloud that has some angular momentum associated with it. So the n equals one state never does. The n equals two state can have zero angular momentum, but it can have other things. And so here's the here's how it works out. So we, uh, we had, remember, n was the principal quantum number, and that just tells you what its energy level is. And so if it's a hydrogen atom with a single electron, then the energy depends only on n. So the angular momentum doesn't actually change the energy. Now for other atoms, where the atoms, where the electrons interact with each other, it gets more complicated and it can change it. We'll come back to that later. But for now, we'll just think about hydrogen. What are the, the possible states? Well, so in n equals one, there's only one possible state and it's that sphere we looked at earlier. But when n equals two, it'll have some orbital angular momentum, but the energies of those are quantized in steps of h bar. And then we have the um, quantum number um, L that indexes basically how much orbital angular momentum it have. L is just a number. If an electron is in a state with a certain value of L, its orbital angular momentum is equal to, well, the square root of L times L plus one times H bar. That's kind of weird, but there you go. So, so that's what its orbital angular momentum is. L, it works out, and, and why is this true? Oh my goodness, you have to go back to the really intense differential equations of the Schrodinger equation to work out that it's true. So I'm just going to assert that it works out that L has to be less than N. So what we're talking about is what are allowed quantum states or what are states that even exist that an electron could be in. At the N equals one state, L must be an integer less than N, a positive integer or a non-negative integer. So L is always zero when N equals one. So L equals zero, the orbital angular momentum is zero times zero plus one, which is zero. So there's no orbital angular momentum. We call that an S orbital. And the reason why it's called S, it's you can think of it as sphere if you want, but that's not the real reason. The real reason has something to do with um, spectroscopy and what people thought lines looked like on, um, on, on photographic plates of spectra of atoms back in the late 19th century. So we're gonna just accept it as an idiom. L equals zero, we call that an S orbital. So in n equals one, that's the only orbital that exists. But when n equals two, L can be either zero or one. So in n equals two, there is an S orbital, but there's also an L equals one P orbital, all right? So electrons can have orbital angular momentum, just not in the ground state of hydrogen. I, well, the one electron in hydrogen in its ground state doesn't have 
orbital angular momentum. If you excite it to a higher state, it can. It could be. So if you excite it to the n equals 2 state, it could be in an s orbital and not have angular momentum, but it could be in a p orbital. And then when you get to n equals 3, l can be 0, 1, or 2. When l equals 2, we call it a d orbital. Again, just that's an idiom. So s, p, d, those are different amounts of total angular momentum. All right. So, and we call these quantum numbers because they index states that are allowed. It can't have any old total orbital angular momentum. So if n equals 3, it can have 1 of l equals 0, 1, or 2. And then you use this, the square root of l times l plus 1 times h bar to figure out what the actual value of the total orbital angular momentum is. It comes in steps. It can't be any old thing. So we've got two quantum numbers here, n and l, um, that together index the possible states in hydrogen. You start with n equals 1, 2, 3, blah, blah, blah. And then for each n, you start with l equals 0, and you count up to n minus 1. So the states, you have the n equals 1, l equals 0 is one state. Then you have n equals 2, l equals 0, and n equals 2, l equals 1. And then n equals 3, l equals 0, n equals 3, l equals 1, n equals 3, l equals 2. All of those are possible states. And it turns out there's one other quantum number that we have to talk about. Remember electron spin, you can only, only one component can be definite at a time. It's the same thing with orbital angular momentum. Only one component can be definite at a time. So we'll go ahead and pick the z-axis as the axis that it's definite along. And we use m sub z as yet another quantum number that indexes the z component of orbital angular momentum. So what can be definite about an orbital? Its energy level, given by n. Um, its total orbital angular momentum, so the, the magnitude of the angular momentum vector, indexed by L, and then a single component, we'll call it the Z component, indexed by M sub Z. And then the X and Y components of orbital angular momentum are completely indefinite. So there's not going to be a quantum number for that. Z components of angular momentum comes in states of steps of H bar. So the Z orbital angular momentum is just MZ times H bar. MZ, again, is just a number. And MZ must be an integer between minus L and L. And so if you count that up, right, suppose L is 2, it can be negative 2, 1, 0, 1, or 2. There's five possibilities. Well, so L was 2, 2 times 2 plus 1 is 5. So there are two L plus 1 possible values of MZ, right? There's L possible ones below 0, L possible ones above 0, plus 0. So MZ equals 0 is a possibility. This is different from electrons. Uh, the spin of an electron never has 0 Z component. Orbital angular momentum can have 0. Z component. So it is possible to have an electron that has some angular momentum and the Z component is zero. So you know it's all in X and Y, but then X and Y are indefinite. So together, N, L, and MZ are the quantum numbers that specify an atomic orbital. They are just numbers that index. How do you interpret the numbers? N, the primary quantum number, tells you the overall energy level. L, the orbital total orbital angular momentum quantum number tells you what its total orbital, orbital angular momentum is. It also tells you is an S, P, or D orbital. L equals 0 is S. L equals 1 is P. L equals 2 is D. Um, and then there's F orbitals and higher things, but eventually, no. Once you get to D orbitals, you've got most of what you need for the periodic table, turns out. Not everything. Um, that bottom line that's often detached at the bottom, you need F orbitals, but whatever. So N, L, M are just numbers. You tell me those numbers, you can figure out what state the electron is in. You can figure out its energy. You can figure out its total orbital angular momentum. And you can figure out the Z component of angular momentum. So those N, L, M are just numbers, but they're ways of indexing allowed states. They're ways of counting states, saying which state is which, right? We've just listed them and given them numbers so we can say which is which. Well, and so all the S orbitals look the same. It turns out bigger S orbitals have bigger probability distributions. So the 2s orbital um, is like the 1s orbital, but the probability cloud is now expanded. It's still a spherical probability cloud, um, but now it's got a higher radius. The p orbitals are actually kind of cool. And so here I've tried to visualize the p orbitals. And now they're wacky. So let's start with the mz equals 0 p orbital. This is an electron that has total orbital angular momentum, L equals 1, so then its total is 
of the square root of 1 times 1 plus 1. So that's the square root of 2 times h bar. So its total orbital angular momentum is root 2 h bar. Its z component is 0, which means all the angular momentum has to be in the x and y plane. Where is it in space? That's what this picture on the upper right tells you. So it turns out there's sort of two clouds, two just disjoint clouds, um, one all above the xy plane, one all below the xy plane. And the electron's probability, this is the prob this is not two different electrons, this is one electron. That is a uh, probability of where it is in space. And so effectively the electron is occupying all of that probability cloud. And again, it's a fuzzy probability cloud. Right? It's, it's higher probability, closer to the center. Um, and then as you go out, you see it gets fuzz, fuzzier, right? darker in color and dimmer and fades out. But there's not a hard edge to it. And then if you look at the probability distribution for an electron whose mz is plus 1, so again, this would be in the n equals 2 state. So that's where we say 2p. 2 is the n equals 2. p, it's a p state, so we know l equals 1. So that tells us the orbital angular momentum. And so then if mz is plus 1, that means that z component is h bar. If it's in that state, then its probability distribution looks like a donut, like this. So it's more spread out in the x and y directions. Um, there's zero probability of being right at the center, but it, again, it's not, if you think about a planet, and it has a z component of angular momentum, you expect it to be circling in the xy plane. That's not what it does here. There's a circle, but it's a donut, and it's not a path. It's a probability distribution. The electron is probabilistically at all those positions all at the same time. So that's what the, the two p orbitals look like. Incidentally, if you've ever seen pictures of orbitals shown by chemists, um, you will never see this one, or you usually will not see this one on the lower left. And that's because um, the chemists actually break down the p orbitals a little differently from how I did here. The way I broke it down is directly in terms of the quantum numbers. It turns out that an electron could be in a, um, in, so, so instead of saying, what is its z angular momentum? They say, are we sure that z is zero? Are we sure that x is zero? Or are we sure that y is zero? That is a different way of, so there's three 2p orbitals. I've called them mz of negative one, zero, and one. Another way of breaking them down that works, the math works out, is to say z is zero, x is zero, y is zero. That's just another way of getting another set of three states. And then these are combinations of those states. And what those look like is this mz zero state, except that the two blobs are, are spread out along the x-axis or the y-axis. So sometimes you will see that for the 2p orbitals. The ones I've shown you here are the ones that correspond directly to the nl and m quantum numbers. And then d orbitals are even more fun still. So again, 3d, what this means is not three dimensions. It means n equals three. And then d orbital tells you that l equals two. So these are all orbitals. The electron is in the state with n equals three. And you can use that if this is hydrogen. You can use minus 13.6 electron volts divided by nine, since three squared is nine, to figure out what the energy of the orbit is. Um, D tells you L equals 2, so its total angular momentum is the square root of 2 times 2 plus 1, so 2 times 3, or the square root of 6 times h bar is the total orbital angular momentum. And then here are the various possible z states. So if L equals um, 2, there are five possible states for M, right? It could be negative 1, sorry, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, or 2. Um, and let's just start. We'll start um, with the simpler ones and work down. If you look at the mz equals plus 2 and minus 2, the actually position probability distribution is exactly the same for, the, for those two states. It's another donut. But look at the scale of the axis here. Notice that the scale is going out to 10 angstroms, whereas in the p orbital, the scale only went out to 5 angstroms. So the electron's probability cloud is spread out more in space. And again, it's a fuzzy donut. It's not a specific place it is. It's a probability cloud, and the probability gets goes down as you get farther away from the center axis circle of the donut. At mz equals plus or minus 1, you get these two sort of um, curved donuts. So they're donuts, but then there's like a huge wind blowing out of the center that causes them to bow away or something like that. That's the probability distribution for one electron that either has mz of plus 1 or minus 1. And then my favorite one, mz equals 0, you get these two lobes above and below, and then you have a donut around the center. So that is the probability distribution 
of uh, an electron that is in the 3D orbital with mz equals zero. Where is it? It's spread out over that probability distribution at all times. So these are what the orbitals look like. And when we say look like, you can actually see this because when you see stuff, it's photons hitting your eyes. And these things are small enough that you can't see them as physical things. So this is a visualization of the probability density as a function of position. But it does tell you in hydrogen where the electron quote unquote is, or at least if you were somehow able to exactly measure the position of the electron, this tells you the probabilities of where you would find it when you measured the position of those electrons. So when an electron changes orbitals, when it jumps state, say suppose it made a transition from the, um, uh, let's say the 3D1 MZ1 orbital down to the ground state, right, the 1S orbital, its probability to shoot in space would change from this thing up here on the upper right down to that sphere we looked at originally. All right, so those are the orbitals in hydrogen. Now, when you have atoms with more electrons, the interactions of the electrons with each other make everything complicated. And that modifies all the energies, it modifies the shapes of the orbitals, it modifies all kinds of stuff. But approximately, we can get pretty far by ignoring those electron interactions or just doing one one thing we'll see the one thing we do with these electron interactions and just say well in a higher in an atom with more electrons all the same orbitals that were available to hydrogen are also available to these electrons um, although because the um, nucleus has a higher charge there's going to be the potential well will be deeper and so um, they'll pull them a little closer the orbitals but whatever rescale them but all these orbitals are available states and then when you have multiple electrons, you just put the electrons in the various different states that are available to them. So why not just put all the electrons in the ground state? Well, it turns out that the there's this thing called the Pauli exclusion principle that you can only put one electron in an allowed state. So if a state is occupied, another electron cannot go in it. It's like theater seats, right? One person can sit in any seat in the theater. The second person who comes in can't sit in the same seat. Uh, and in fact, nowadays they have to sit in a seat like two or three over, so they maintain a distance of at least six feet. So the theaters are more quantized than they used to be, except they're entirely closed down, so never mind. Um, only one electron may occupy an allowed quantum state. Now it does turn out you can actually put two electrons in each orbital because the two possible spin states are make it two different quantum states. So really you need four quantum numbers, N, L, and M for the orbital, and then S for the spin of the electron. So for helium, which has two electrons in it, you can put both electrons in the 1s orbital. So one electron will be n equals 1, l equals 0, mz equals 0, and sz equals plus h bar over 2, or sorry, sz equals 1 half. It depends on whether you're talking the physical angular momentum or the quantum number. And the other electron will be n equals 1, l equals 0, mz equals 0, and sz of minus 1 half. So you can put two electrons in each orbital. And so then multi-electron atoms when they're in their ground state, what you do is you just fill up the lowest energy available orbitals. Um, and once one orbital is, is filled up, you can't use it anymore. You have to go to the next one and you just fill them up, um, right? Just again, like suppose everybody wants to sit at the front of the theater. Once the front row is filled, the next people go to the second row, so on and so forth. Now, like I said, electron-electron interactions make calculating the actual energies a whole lot harder. Um, but this is a really good starting approximation. Now, it does turn out that the S, P, and D, so in hydrogen, the S, P, and D orbitals of a given N all have exactly the same energy. Not exactly, there's these things called fine structure and hyperfine and blah, 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 but we're not gonna go into that. Um, to, uh, very close, very, very close to exactly the same energies. In other atoms, the energies can appreciably different. Um, a typical, like say a 2P orbital will usually have a higher energy than a 2S orbital. And so that's what, so this last slide I have here is why I call it the periodic table construction kit. Um, what I've got here is all the various orbitals available to atoms. So going from left to right, each column is a value of N. So furthest to the left is one, then the next one over is two. And then in each column, I have the various available L states so the first column one, the only available L state is, is L equals zero, the S orbital. Next column two, 
we have two available L, L states, L equals 0 and L equals 1. So that's the S and the P orbital. And then the next column is 3. We have S, P, and D are allowed states. And then the circles on each line represent the electrons that you can put into that orbital. So the 1s orbital, you can put two electrons, one spin up and one spin down. Same thing for the 2s orbital. For the 2p orbital, you can put six electrons. Why? Because remember, the p orbital is actually three different orbital states, because when L equals 1, which is what you have in PM, can be negative 1, 0, or 1. So that's three different orbitals. And you can put two electrons in each orbital, so that's why there's six little dots here. Um, when you get to D, um, there are uh, 10 possibilities, right? Because there's five orbitals, negative 2, 1, 0, 1, and 2 for MZ. And then each one can take two electrons. So there's 10 little circles there. And for us. So finally, the height of the line on this diagram represents its relative energy. Now, it's not quantitative. Don't measure the height and say that's how much energy it is. Just the higher ones are at higher energies than the lower ones. So the 1s orbital is at lower energy than the 2s orbital, and the 2p orbital is at higher energy than the 2s orbital, 3s higher than 2p, 3p higher than 3s, but notice 3d is actually higher energy than 4s. So whereas in hydrogen, n entirely tells you the energy, once you get to multi-electron atoms, it actually turns out um, you start filling up n equals 4 before you finish filling up n equals 3, because you'll, you'll put stuff in the 4s orbitals before you put stuff in the 3d orbitals all right so just so how do you figure out where the electron electrons are in, a, in the given atom look on the periodic table um, its atomic number is the number of electrons it has start checking off circles from the bottom right so if we have lithium there's three electrons in lithium so you check off two in the 1s and then one in the 2s that's where the electrons are going to be um, and then in the homework, and I think also in one of the example problems in the video that you'll watch for Monday, um, I do some other atoms with this periodic table construction kit. So this construction kit is um, based entirely on these quantum numbers that I've been talking about all along. The other thing, why does this make a periodic con table construction kit? Well, here's one more rule. Um, every time you complete a P orbital, go to the next line on the periodic table, except for the very first line. So the very first line is just completing the 1s. So you have hydrogen and helium. Those are those two things that stick up on the top of the periodic table, right? Finish the first line. Go to the second line. You start with the 2s orbital. So you have lithium and beryllium. And then you start filling in the 2p orbitals. So you have boron and carbon and oxygen. Um, and I'm doing this from memory, so I forgot what the next one is. Haha. <laughs> and the neon. Um, and now you're done because you've filled up the 2p orbital because you've checked off those eight. And so now you go down to the next line, 3s, so on and so forth. So every time you finish a, a p orbital, you go to the next line. But then when you have to insert like the d orbital, you have to insert them in between the s and the p orbital, right? Because that's where the energy goes. So from left to right, um, it's, it's going to more and more energy effectively. And then each time you complete a P orbital, you go down to the next line on the periodic table. So you can use this to build up the periodic table and figure out exactly where all the squares are going to be. All right. So that's it for now. Um, there's a video, um, one of the old original old school videos um, for you to watch before Monday. And then on Monday, I will post uh, the homework assignment that's due Wednesday. Um, and then Wednesday, we'll have the last lecture of the semester. And then Friday, I'll give you a homework assignment, but it won't ever be due. I'll just give it to you, and I'll give you the solutions. And then we'll have exam three the week after that. More about exam three next week. Bye!